Welcome to today's uh, meeting, the meeting of the Economic Development Commission of June, July 29th. Somehow we're already chasing down August. Thanks to everyone for being here. I hope everyone's enjoying your summers. Um, first on our agenda, uh, and I think we'll probably move through fairly quickly given the summer uh, workload and where we're at with several of these that we'll talk about, so we can hear from our planning director, um, Beverly Mesa Zent. Excited to have her here today. Uh, so first, um, first item we've got on today's agenda is the minutes from our meeting out at Pease on June 3rd. I know Sean circulated those last week, so uh, does anyone have any comments to those, any changes there too? No, I move to approve. Great, move second. to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Great. Aye. Thank you, everybody. So the first working group update we have on today's agenda is the business retention and expansion. I know that group has been meeting regularly and working on um, finding. I won't steal anyone's thunder. So, Katie or Sean, you want to run us through? Go, go ahead. You've, sure. you've been talking to UNH most, okay, so most recently. Uh, earlier in the week, or last Friday, we received the, uh, the first draft of the survey based on the work that the group's been doing really over the course of the summer. Uh, so we're looking at that, and then we'll get, we will reconvene, maybe not next week because Alan's away, but certainly within the next two weeks to work on finalizing the survey. Um, we're still on track for a sep early September launch of the survey. Um, yeah, so really just making the progress we were hoping to make. Great. I, did, um, I don't know, is, is the survey uh, draft available to see at this point, or is it... Um, because I don't know that anyone else has ever seen it um, other than the subcommittee. So I, I, I'll defer to how, how it's, we, <clears throat> we, we, just reserved, we just received the first draft. Right. Oh, I know that. Yeah. But I mean, just from a process standpoint, I'll, I'll, I'll d defer to the EDC how that sure. I should know work. You, you guys have, I think we kind of talked about the vision for uh, the scope of that at last month's meeting i think if you feel like it's in draft form ready for review so we can add any other feedback um i think just it would be helpful maybe for the commissioners to have a chance to see that and, okay. and at least have a sense of of where that is i know i don't want to you guys are doing great work so i don't want to muddy it up too much but i think it would be helpful for folks to have a chance to just see kind of. I promise. I promise not to muddy it. No, <laughs> no, of course. <laughs> you guys are very interested in it. Yeah, of course. And same. And I did. I know there was a. The survey is out, and um, the draft survey is out there. I started to try to go through right. to see it, but I didn't want to actually take it <clears throat> myself. So I didn't. Sure. I had the same question. In a, in a perfect world, the draft that gets reviewed would be the second draft. I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Because we're doing still doing some uh, lift some editing on it um, now. Um, the, the only thing that comes up is just the timeline, um, the review period, if, and figuring that out, because that's four, we've got four, five, six weeks before right. the September launch. And so maybe my perfect world idea doesn't work with that time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th there's been a lot of email back and forth about kind of the purpose of the survey and what we want it to be very different, not very different, fairly different from the 2016 survey, which was a while ago. And, yeah. and, and the thought in terms of the subcommittee, I'll speak for Bob, has really been pushing this, is we want it to be a launching pad. We want it to be a survey to understand what businesses need to grow and expand, and if they even want to grow and expand. And then we're asking um, kind of what the EDC and the, and the Economic Development Office can do to support that. And we're also inviting them to contact us to, to start a relationship. And that's, that's really, I, th I think, what's, big, what's different in terms of we really want it to be a starting point, not just a report card. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's really been the intention. But I can certainly summarize that and, and um, you know, check with the community. I think if the timeline is real important to us, and, and I guess that's a little bit of a question mark, we, we should share this draft. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say the timeline is because, just one last update. So, I know, oh. thought this was going to be quick. But oh, that's all <laughs> right. Uh, the, um, the Small Business Development Center, SPDC, right. they are going to launch a resiliency survey, which they've launched for the, which they've done for the last two years, and they want to make it annual, and they're targeting September. 
So in our conversations, that's a statewide survey. And the, in the first two surveys, they got great response from Portsmouth businesses. So we're concerned about two surveys at the same time. Um, so our thought is, and I, I did run this by the SBDC yesterday, is that we want to go first. Yeah. Uh, we want to go early September. And if they're later in September, they can do some wordsmithing around, you know, we know you just had a survey from Portsmouth, but this is, this is a different, it's different and, and hopefully encourage businesses to take two in September. So that's, that's, the, that's the, yeah. Can I, I recommend that you share whatever draft is available, yeah. say Monday, August 8th, and the commissioners are given five days to review and provide feedback so that we don't impact your timeline. If those folks have interest, they can provide it. If they don't, then we've missed the window so that we can stay to your timeline. I think it would also be helpful to understand the post-survey timeline for how long do people get to give their feedback and then what are the next steps as far as outreach and when we might we plug in to figure out where to focus based on the feedback. Yep. I think that's helpful. And our next meeting is going to be likely around Labor Day weekend, which is probably syncs right up with launch. So I think some okay. view of that in advance would be helpful. I like that idea. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Good suggestion. Good work, guys. I know it's kind of been a re-engineering of what we first thought we'd set out to do um, late last year, but I think it'll be helpful and meaningful, the, the info we'll get and the results and starting the relationships with the businesses. Um, and I know, Sean, you had circulated as part of this month's meeting the information on the uh, BIA on their sort of roundtable yes. effort. And do you see there being a lot of synergy with what I, we're hearing at the state level and the SPC? I, I, I do. I mean, if you look at the, you know, the impediments, it's, it's um, housing costs, it's workforce, it's high energy costs, all, all those big, big rocks that, that we know about. And, and with the conversation with, with the subgroup has been, how do we get to other, other issues yeah. that we can actually affect, you know, more directly? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the intent is to catalog those, but also try to get to that next level, sure. maybe more actionable in the immediate term. So that'll, some of that will be called out in the survey. So the questions we'll have are intended to get to those yes. items. Great, good to hear. All right, thank you guys. Um, for the data team, uh, it's Jacob and I. I know uh, it sounds like we're starting to get some information back from the assessment department. Sean and I are hoping to circle up at some point soon, but is there anything you can share with the group today? Well, so just in, in, in trying to track down data, um, uh, Roseanne was able to get back to 2010 at a very uh, high level and just look at the, the difference between commercial, the commercial tax base and residential, not necessarily all the different That's types right. of units. Um, but one of the things she and I have been working on and I want to bring to the, the, the working group is looking at it by, by neighborhood, if you will. So downtown versus West End versus um, Route sure. 1 and others. And it just, it, it, it's a start. It's high level, but it, I think it does address that question of can we get can we get some historical data? And the answer is yes, back to 2010. Right. When you say look back to 2010, where is she is she pulling this off of like PDF documents or is this stored somewhere in like an accessible type of? She like, has uh, a software that is okay. not Excel. Okay. That is not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if it's accessible per se. I think she's really doing a lot of the analysis and pulling it and mm. massaging the data. So cool. That, awesome. Yeah. It's exciting. Great. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Um, Sarah, I know you had mentioned the, the group has convened um, for the land use committee. Uh, any, I know you weren't able to yeah, attend Yeah, I think last because our, our EDC meeting at Pease ran over, I missed the last. Um, I missed the one after that, and then there was one the 4th of July week I missed. I'm not sure, um, Assistant Mayor Kelly, if you were able to attend the last land use subcommittee meeting the first week of July. I was able to. Um, in, in that meeting, we really um, went over the survey results from the small groups that we had um, that broke out in panels with um, focus on ADUs, so people who had successfully done ADUs, um, architects and designers, um, builders. We, we kind of pull that information to try to look at how to streamline the process and then 
uh, Councilor Moreau is bringing that or has brought that in front of the planning board to, to discuss more. So that's really, um, we're really high focused on the ADUs right now and trying to streamline that process. But the potential of looking at, um, and Beverly can touch more on this if she'd like, but um, with making a, a much clearer guide sheet, a step-by-step -step for people who want to do ADUs, um, and then broadly looking at some other communities around the country have pre-designed ADUs per se, um, which then allows an easier process too. So like pre-approved floor plans and models um, and looking at the process versus detached and attached. And so that's kind of where we are with that. Great, thank you. So that's all we have for our working groups. And next up would be Ben and any updates that you could provide on the Chamber Collaborative. Sure, uh, happy to. I'll start, um, we're in midsummer, so it makes sense to talk about travel and tourism uh, first. So uh, we are certainly in the height of the season here. Um, seeing very strong numbers from uh, what I hear from hotel um, folks and, and restaurant tours and the like. Uh, retailers ha have uh, commented that it's been a very good summer so far. Um, the hotels have mentioned that uh, things are very good and it's better than uh, the past few years, obviously. Um, but they, I think they were hoping for more. I think they, they always like project really high. Um, and it hasn't quite met that, but it's, they're very happy with the numbers that they're seeing. The, the, the rates are, are very strong, so it's been a very good summer for them. Um, a, a positive on, on the hotels, another positive on the hotel side of things is they're starting to see larger uh, corporate groups come back, group uh, business, which is typically midweek week business, which has never been our strong suit. We're like a, a weekend kind of town. Um, so that has been very encouraging to them. They're seeing those groups that for the last couple of years have been like 20 and 40 size uh, meetings and conferences um, and now in the hundreds again in, in, in larger groups. So um, we actually have a, a large group planned for next fall that's going to be a multi-hotel group uh, that's going to be using different venues around town, the music hall. It's kind of what uh, most communities we would refer to as a citywide um, tourism event. So that's that's very good. Um, anecdotally, uh, international travel seems to be back. Um, they spent a little bit of time down in our visitor center and welcomed people from uh, Saudi Arabia the other day. You know, there's like a lot of international folks coming, um, a lot of Canadians uh, coming back. So that's been very, very good uh, to see. Um, you know, just as a whole, I think um, if you're listening to any headlines, there is a, this general growing concern about a potential recession and what does that mean? And these supply chain problems are still hanging out there, lingering and just sort of disrupting business as a whole. Um, you know, costs are certainly, inflation is definitely a big concern, uh, which is like a really interesting um, scenario for a business leader because things are great right now, but there's like this cliff that people are afraid of um, that might be coming. So it's, it's this really interesting kind of setting. Um, I was going to mention the BIA roundtable, but we just talked about that. That was a very great session uh, with our colleagues at the state. Um, I did want to just highlight um, an event we have coming up uh, a week from yesterday, August 4th, next Thursday, we will have our annual um, dinner. Uh, normally that's called Street Life. I think most people are familiar with that where we kind of shut down a street <coughs> or a, a parking lot somewhere in town and have dinner. Um, this year we are taking a detour, so we're calling it the summer detour. We're going inside uh, for the first time, so it better be hot or raining that day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we will be at Jimmy's Jazz and Blues Club uh, next Thursday, August 4th from 5 to 8 p.m. Uh, we'll, one of the things we do at that event every year is we recognize uh, business and community leaders and I'll, I'll share who we're recognizing this year because it will be public uh, it's already kind of out there anyways um, our small business of the year is New Hampshire Black Heritage Trail um, the large business of the year is actually a Durham business Harmony Homes if you're not familiar with them they've done some phenomenal work at building um, housing for their employees and child care for their employees so they're they're really setting the bar high for that um, volunteer of the Year, Steve Swaljay from Northwestern Mutual. The Collaborator of the Year, we're proud to recognize two individuals. One um, is someone we've all met, Courtney Richings from uh, Portsmouth High School's Career Technical Education Program. And then secondly, David Vargas from Vita Cantina will also be recognized with that award. And then we have a, a, a fifth award that we change every year. We give it a fun name. This year we are calling it Building a Better Community Award, and that's going to go to Portsmouth Housing Authority. So we'll be recognizing Craig Welch and his team um, for their phenomenal work in our community, particularly the, the new project on Court Street, the Ruth uh, Griffin House. So that's, uh, that's next Thursday. If you uh, can join us, please do. Um, it's, uh, we have great uh, participation so far. 
Uh, I think we're over 300 tickets sold. Um, kind of cap out around 400. So uh, it's it's going to be a really fun evening. Great music. Um, bad jokes by me. It'll be really interesting. <laughs> uh, that that is my update. Happy to answer any questions if there is any. I have a question, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Ben, what are uh, what are people reporting for staffing levels and ability to hire and keep staff? Um, the, from what I have heard, that no one loves their current level of staffing, but they have found it to be manageable. Okay. Um, they would love to be able to hire more. Um, you know, we still see restaurants that you know are, are dark two days a week, one day a week, maybe not doing lunch, things like that. Um, so no one. Um, What's becoming more and more challenging is those more professional jobs. It's not just it's not just it's everywhere. You know, across the board. We had a very interesting call with uh, Convenient MD as an example. Um, they, they announced their move. They, I think everyone probably saw an article in the paper about their hiring, um, and, and they're trying to hire at all levels: accountants and and people to work in their headquarter office, um, down to um, you know nursing and, and X-ray tech type people um, in the clinics and, and they're they are really struggling to find people to fill those jobs and, and those are good healthcare jobs you know that those are they're good high wage jobs um, so it, it's all across the board that it's a struggle but I think people are finding ways to make do with what they have um, which is a stressful spot for a business owner to be in I would think sure. thank you yeah, thanks sure Tom uh, Ben is there any data from the hotel and the restaurant merchants on where their customers are coming from? Yeah, I wish. Um, they're, they're, uh, we can anecdotally get some of that information, but the, to really get a, 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 a true snapshot um, of hotel occupancy and rates and, and um, destination where people are coming from, there is a very expensive report called the Star Report that communities can purchase. It's out of our our capacity to do that as as a chamber we just don't have the resources to do that so that that does uh, share some of that I've, I've 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 looked for alternative ways to find that information i thought since people punch their plates into their parking meter app or whatnot we might be able to find that through our parking friends it turns out they only capture the number not the state of the the license plate so that was a dead end but um you know so we are looking for that information but it, it's it's just not really a easy thing to grasp so unfortunately no it's too bad. Yeah. I know. I, I wish it was. There's uh, There are some really interesting softwares that Sean and I have explored. Again, uh, not inexpensive uh, to, to utilize that um, use uh, all the the scary data stuff from your phone mm -hmm. um, to track where you go and how long you spend time there and all that sort of stuff. It's really creepy Big Brother um, kind of stuff. Uh, and it's great data. And we could pinpoint exactly where people come from down to their you know if they have a pool in their backyard or not um, it's, but it's not, uh, it's not that bad it's pretty bad <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, it's you know it's something we'll continue to look at but it, it, you know I think that was you know a $20,000 software package or something like that so. maybe it would be possible <clears throat> get the actual hotel merchants to collect zip codes or something as a, I mean the logistics would be yeah the the hotels are fairly protective of that information. Yeah, right. uh, we, we've, from time to time, even to get like, you know, tell me your occupancy rate, you know, are you 95% occupied? Um, they're pretty hesitant to share that information. I'm not exactly sure the why behind that. I mean, because of competitive uh, reasons with their, the competitors in the community and other communities. Uh, but they, they're, they keep that pretty locked down. Occasionally we can get some good information from folks um, if we ask really nicely. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is especially for the larger franchised hotels proprietary to like yeah. Marriott Hilton yeah. through their systems that I think they in addition to the owner's reluctance probably is a bigger data protection concern on theirs um, I know at some point I was at the EDC I know there's a report out there that tracks merchant spend and credit cards and zip codes I'm trying to remember where I would have come across that but I think that might be another avenue to explore at some point if yeah the one metric that is available um, but it's a pretty broad metric is the how much um, rooms and meals tax is collected and, but that is reported by county so we get lumped in with the whole county um, and it's you know it's like a quarter behind that we get that information publicly um, so it's uh, it's it's older data but it's at least a metric to use yep yeah, the real difficulty is not knowing where to spend your promotional dollars 
where yeah. they're going to get the biggest mm -hmm. bang. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. We, the one spot we can track and, and get good information on is uh, through website visits. Um, you, you can geographically know where someone lives if they're looking at your website. So we, that is the metrics that we use when we're looking at that data. Are people looking um, from the Boston market, New York market, North Shore? Like where are people looking um, at our website? And, and we can, you know, through relationships with both like the music hall, things like that, we can compare notes with them and kind of get, get a good sense of where folks are coming from to look at those uh, websites. So that, that's one way that we've always used. Um, we do that particularly with Restaurant Week where we decide how we promote restaurant week. We can look back at previous restaurant weeks and during that time period, where were people looking at the menus and like, so we can drill down pretty deep on some of that stuff, but that's the one spot we can, that we have to utilize that. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Anyone else questions? Okay, so next on our agenda is our city council update. So if Councilor Lombardi or Assistant Mayor Kelly has any updates they'd like to share with us, we'd. Well, I'll, I'll start. I'm sure uh, Assistant Mayor can add some detail. Um, we had a, a marathon meeting, uh, a last meeting. We got, didn't get out of there until midnight. Um, but uh, along with that, we, um, we have, you know, uh, funded a lot of projects, um, and we're going to keep Peter Rice pretty busy for a long time here. Um, I would say that one important one is the uh, Prescott Park Master Plan Phase 1. Uh, Tom came and gave a, a phenomenal presentation to the City Council um, about that. And um, so we have basically funded that uh, Phase 1 of that project, which is going to be beginning to mitigate the uh, effects of ocean rise on the, uh, on the park. Um, we also, um, you know, school facilities, uh, I'm just looking at the list here, there's, there's a lot. Um, there's the, um, the wells at, at um, Pease, the uh, Bartlett Street, intersection. Um, these are all kind of difficult places in the city that um, need repair, so it's pretty pretty interesting. Um, we also approved the, um, the uh, agreement with the uh, teachers, which included a 4% uh, increase for teachers, um, which I thought was really good. Uh, so let us, what else did we do? A lot. Oh, we're also going to be doing um, ARPA fund work sessions, um, and that'll be a public thing so that we can better uh, appropriate those funds. Uh, I don't know. Assistant Mayor, do you have more you can add? I feel like you covered a lot. As, as uh, Councilman Barry said, we had a presentation heavy council meeting which is wonderful um one of the things that we also voted on was to uh with councilor blaylock was to send a letter to the manufacturer of our turf field um as if you've been following along that's been um, a little bit of a heated conversation um concerning pfas um the latest tests show that there's there's very limited low non-concerning in pfas um as there is with pretty much everything in the world now with the field. So, um, Councilor Bailiff wanted to send a letter to them. Um, the governance committee had to delay their presentation. Um, they will be presenting on Monday. I'm really excited. They've done a lot of work to clean up some of our, our old um, ordinances and codes. It's really, again, I think the overall goal, I, goal of our council is to streamline some of these things. Um, Another thing that happened uh, at a former meeting that I don't think that we discussed is that uh, the We Speak organization at the high school brought forward changing on city and school calendars from Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, and that did pass as a vote. Um, so I'm really proud of those kids for keeping up, you know, the enthusiasm with that and really looking to have um, fair and true representation in our city, especially as we, you know, in 2020 signed a resolution to be 
a racial justice municipality. I think it falls in line with that. It falls in line with our motto to listen to the future and listen to our students. Um, but I think besides that, I think Councilor Lombardi covered everything really well. Thank you. One question. I know the city has decided to delay <laughs> property revaluations, I think, since the last time we met. Um, any concerns about the impact to residents when those do finally take effect as far as, like, prorating the impact or because I, I know property tax revaluations and the impact on residents has, has come up several times in our conversation. So is there anything we need to get in front of from an EDC perspective around how money is allocated, um, you know, from, from tax to help soften the blow once those do take effect? I think that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure there's an answer to it at this point. The, the reason uh, the assessor delayed this is because the real estate market has been uh, a roller coaster mm -hmm. uh, and is not really representative of um, what is the true value of property at this time. I mean, it is a, a very narrow point of time, and I think that um, she thought that the uh, taking a longer view of that would be important. Um, to, so I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I, I, I think it's, I think in the past when, when we've had longer periods between revaluations, when those finally hit, the difference has been large. So if the messaging is that by letting the market stabilize, then it'll, you know, ha have a more evening effect on the increases, I think that's a good I, message I for residents. I think that is the anticipated result. Um, I, we obviously won't know until we're there. And I think in terms of um, implementation, I don't think it would be prorated. It would just be once they're set, that would be the affect the budget or be tied in with the budget for that particular year when the mill rate is set. It wouldn't be anything that is rear looking against the interim period between now and then, mm -hmm. I believe. Jacob? Just out of interest, um, was that decision made kind of from a macro level where you're saying all oh, the, the market factors just aren't ready for a revaluation or that did they start getting into the weeds and see the, the rate was so high that this wouldn't make, this would be a bad, bad situation for homeowners? I'm just trying to understand like where. I can jump in here if that's appropriate. Yeah, sure. Um, to, to speak to the equity piece, it was felt that since we don't have to do it, we're still within the range of acceptability from the state. Um, right now, the, the disproportionate burden on some uh, taxpayers uh, made it less equitable. So they, the hope is when we wait one more year or two more years that the equitability um, issue is resolved or, or a, a, on, on a more even footing. Mm -hmm. And just out of my ignorance, is there a specific state level that is required to have like market value set or a, a rate at a certain level of market values? Yes, like, there's okay. a range and I don't want to misspeak for Roseanne. Um, we're still well within that range. And it's, is it a five-year window that it has to be done? It is a five-year window, and so we would have to do it again in 25. Or to no, the, this year, yeah. I'm got, I've got my fiscal years and my year years mixed yeah, up. Right. Two years from now, so that is 24. At the latest. At Correct. The latest. At the to latest. Within great compliance yeah. with the state. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions or comments for our counselors? Um, if not, I have one. I don't want to keep us from getting to Beverly for too much longer, but I did have one question that I think will be relevant to this group um, for our counselors. I know next Monday I saw uh, the council is set to see drawings on the McIntyre project. I just ask, and I know you guys will keep us surprised as the progress and we'll stay posted on that, but if there's anything we can provide in terms of feedback on uses or, or um, overall economic um, relevance. We haven't seen them yet. For the city. <laughs> right, no, no, I understand. I, and I don't think the design is, is necessarily germane yeah. to this group, but um, as, wherever we can be, involved or advocate for uh, a positive outcome there. I think we would be happy to be involved in that. Thank you. Great. Right. So without further ado, I'd like to invite our planning director, Beverly Mesa Zent, up to join us. Uh, and thank you for putting a presentation together today and coming to speak with us. I sit here so I can see right. Yeah, wherever's best for you. As we scroll Absolutely. Through it. Um, I think there's one slide up. That is there the first is. slide. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to see the, there we go. Oh, oh there's a slide up. Let me get up there. So, thank you so much. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Beverly Mesa Zent. I am the planning director. I've been in Portsmouth 
um, I guess about six years, I mean six months. It feels like six years. Well, it feels like six years, but anyway, and I'm coming to you from Redmond, Washington, where I was the Deputy Director of Planning and Development there. So um, glad to be here. Uh, I'd like to just go ahead and jump right in and, and walk you through what the agenda is going to be. Um, this is, a, I'm going to provide in this presentation just a general overview of the work program of the Planning Department. Many of you are probably familiar with that, but just like to really talk to you about really the different areas that we touch. Um, talk about the regulatory work plan, which has just uh, been reviewed a little bit in terms of the Land Use Committee, who we work very closely with on that. Um, uh, some of the regulations that are pending and coming before uh, the council within the next six months. Uh, current development projects, things that are really under review right now and things that are really pending, either they're under construction or they will be very soon. And then just touch on the part of the parking study that I know you've been briefed on, but that really, uh, that we're involved in as part, as the planning department, so. Um, I, I wanted to include this slide. I, I know that everyone knows what sustainability means. We talk about it all the time. But I think the term has been sort of commandeered a lot to be um, analogous with uh, environmental stewardship. And for my part, I always like to remind staff that you know sustainability really is a three-legged table. It's really what's good for people, what's good for the environment, and what's good for the economy. And that it's very important in that table that those legs are balanced. And when we move one bar, it does affect another bar, but that all are important to basically meet the uh, demands of sustainability, which means that we're preparing, uh, we're doing things that really do not compromise the future. So it has to be good for all three. And as far as that goes, we in the planning department really touch all three legs of that table. Next slide. Um, we do development review and support, facilitating all development projects in the city, moving those through the boards and commissions, through land use approvals, and then coordinating with all the departments as we get those projects constructed, working with public works, working with inspections department, legal to get those projects underway. Um, we also uh, do customer support as projects come in. We guide the uh, developers and uh, builders to really help them understand the process and help navigate what can be a complicated process and help them to get through the process to the degree that we're, we're able. Uh, we also do other things like stand up outdoor dining. That's something that fell to our department to support this year and help that pro those types of projects also keep moving within the community. Uh, environmental stewardship and sustainability is a part is one of the uh, areas of concentration for the department. We support the conservation committee, uh, the sustainability committee. We are uh, very very close to issuing an RFP for the climate action plan, uh, which will provide a roadmap for the future for achieving some of the. Uh, climate resiliency goals and also the um, uh, carbon reduction goals of the community as we move forward. Um, and so we also coordinate climate resiliency and sea level rise, uh, working with the community to prepare for that. Um, there was a substantial study and a great deal of information on our website helping uh, property owners to prepare for uh, climate related changes, uh, beginning with sea level rise, uh, also other f uh, event frequency and things of that nature. And then we also are focused on community initiatives, what's, what's important to people. Uh, we work to advance workforce housing. This is really the, um, the theme that has dominated the first round of regulatory amendments that are going before the council. We uh, are involved in community involvement as we move each of those regulatory amendments through uh, the community. We are the keepers also of the master plan, which is basically the community's vision that should really be informing all our decisions and regulatory um, amendments and our um, uh, uh, all the development as we move forward in the community, that really is the community's vision. And so I think we will be looking at updating that master plan with a very broad community outreach effort. Um, we Community development, our CDBG entitlement is also housed in our department and we help to disperse that funding in accordance with, um, with uh, federal laws to get that to affect, uh, I think, the um, uh, low to moderate uh, income groups within our community. And then as I mentioned, master planning is a big part of what we do. Just jumping in briefly to the regulatory work plan, um, and this really is, uh, if you can advance to the next slide, this really is informed by the council goals and objectives. And in January of this year, the council adopted uh, multiple goals and priorities for the community that were really were supposed to inform um, uh, the development of the budget for the next fis fiscal year, and then also other city policies and programs. Um, 
I focused here on the count, city council housing priorities because this really was the um, what informed the first round of regulatory amendments. And just you know, walking through those, the council really wants to see more diversity of housing types and price points, remove barriers for housing diversification in neighborhoods. Example will be ADUs, which are currently underway, as um, Assistant Mayor Kelly mentioned. A restructure incentives, which is also the subject of our regulatory work plan, to allow greater public benefit in workforce housing construction and identify partnerships, coalitions, and funding opportunities to deliver more affordable housing to our community. So, Just in summary, the regulatory work plan, which is currently underway, in includes a phase one, which is a code cleanup. It was to imp uh, improve regulatory impl implementation, align our codes with the legislative intent, and eliminate um, unintended consequences. This does affect, in, in some cases, uh, how we implement building height. That's been the subject of uh, sometimes um, maybe disparate implementation and really kind of making sure that we are able to make that more clear and consistently implemented. Um, this is actually uh, due to come to a vote, I believe, to the planning board on August 18th. So we hope to move that back to council for um, for uh, subsequent hearing and readings. Uh, the phase two accessory dwelling unit amendments, uh, the first drafts will be going to the land use committee. Um, this allows for um, uh, removing barriers for ADUs within our community, providing that important um, uh, housing opportunity uh, integrated into the neighborhoods, which is uh, something that is, I think, uh, more, there's a great deal of more interest here than other jurisdictions I've worked in, and I think it's because of the development pattern uh, here, but uh, definitely removing barriers, understanding where the, uh, the problems are, but also keeping in mind as we remove those barriers that we want to continue to um, understand how these interact with neighborhoods and traffic and parking. So I think we are very close to putting out that first round of um, of red lines, and those will go to, as soon as they leave the Land Use Committee, they'll go to Council to be referred to the Planning Board uh, for refinement. Um, and we think that probably there's a good chance that early fall we could see adoption on those. And then the last uh, Phase three amendments, which is late fall, we'll undertake those. It's to adjust our incentives to place a higher emphasis on workforce housing. Currently, our development incentives really do invite either community space or workforce <coughs> housing. I don't want to say universally they, <coughs> community space is picked, but almost almost uh, pretty consistently community space is the, the to get that additional height. Uh, they choose to do community space and really look, taking a look at those and seeing how we can deliver more workforce housing and how that pencils out for developers. So we won't just do regulations that aren't mindful of how uh, the pro formas and how these work for developers to see how we can make that balance uh, work for them and deliver more workforce housing integrated within the downtown and throughout the community. And so we think late fall we'll take that up and hopefully by the end of the year have those adopted. Uh, and then I believe we'll have another round of regulatory amendments that will come forward. Uh, I want to spend a little time because I know it's a great interest to this group to talk about development projects. I think everybody in this room probably knows this community better than me. And so if I don't uh, know an answer, I can for sure get more information to you on a specific project. Um, but did want to talk a little bit about the, um, the uh, great deal of development that the community is, uh, is either experiencing currently and will be experiencing, I think, over the next year. So if we could just jump right into that. Um, 83 Peverly Hill Road. Uh, it's an open space plan unit development, a site plan. It has 56 single family dwelling units, um, uh, 2,950 feet of public roadway. It has recreational pocket parks, public bike path, landscaping, open space, and they have begun site work. They are just, they have already received approvals from uh, the land use boards and they are moving towards building permits. They've started with some site work. Uh, 3400 Lafayette, a uh, 50 unit multifamily residential project. It's a 45 uh, acre parcel. It was approved in 2021. They're still securing their building permits and working through some of the um, uh, uh, stipulations that prior to uh, moving forward with construction. Uh, 2454 Lafayette, many of you know this area is the Cinemagic or this, this development site is Cinemagic. Uh, demolition of the Cinemagic movie theater, construction of a five-story, 95-unit multifamily condominium building, 5,000-square-foot uh, restaurant pad, um, 21,897 square feet of community space, and they are working to uh, secure their, all their building permits at this point. Uh, 64 Vaughn, a redevelopment of existing four-story structure, construction of a new commercial and office structure. It's under construction at this time. 
um, 8999 Foundry Place, Lot 6. It's a four-story mixed-use building with a penthouse, uh, interior parking garages on two levels, retail space on the ground floor, office space on the first floor, 43 residential units on the second, third, and fourth, and penthouse floors. They are securing building permits. Uh, 165 Deer Street, a lot three hotel. It's a, um, I believe it's going to be a, uh, it says Hyatt Place here, um, uh, 98,000 uh, 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 gross square feet of, uh, of building, uh, 144 guest rooms, for fifth floor restaurant deck, uh, meeting spaces, and they are securing building permits as well. Uh, 3458 Lafayette is partial demolition of existing buildings, construction of two new structures, total of 75 residential units still securing building permits. Uh, 60 Penn Hollow, uh, also known as Brick Market, as the Brick Market, a new construction of four story building, commercial and office uses, two levels of underground below grade parking, and it's nearing completion. 93 Pre uh, Pleasant, uh, redevelopment of an existing four story structure, structure and construction. Um, uh, of a new structure, I can't remember how many units, I believe it's less than 50. Uh, commercial, uh, um, I'm sorry, it has also has commercial office, below grade parking, and they are securing building permits. On the horizon, still in development review, not through the land use boards, but moving forward, I think we can, uh, we expect to see some uh, movement on these uh, next summer. Uh, one Congress, it's a reuse of an existing commercial building at one and three Congress Street. There will be some existing building demolition, new construction of a three-story to the rear of the existing buildings with associated and required site improvements, um, retain some of the existing uses at one and three, um, and then a new office building to the rear of that site. Uh, 161 Deer Street, Lot 5, uh, Foundry Place. Uh, the project consists of replacing of the existing one-story commercial building at 161 Deer Street, a new four-story with a penthouse building with associated and required site improvements and parking below street level, below grade. 238 Deer Street is a mixed-use building uh, uh, with, with, uh, with commercial uses on the first floor. 21 proposed market rate micro residential units, open space uh, components, including a walkway on 46 Maplewood, deck space on the penthouse level uh, will be available to residents as open space. Two Russell, uh, three buildings consisting of office, retail, commercial, and residential uses. Uh, building one is a four-story office building. Building two is a five-story mixed-use residential building at the corner of Deer Street and Russell Street with below-grade parking. And building three is a proposed five-story mixed-use residential building along Russell Street. And these are pending projects. These are uh, currently tied up in the courts, but we uh, are, uh, I think, uh, have had some favorable um, early uh, lower court decisions on these. 53 Green, 1 Rains, and 105 Bartlett. And I provided some images here. I believe they all have significant residential components in them. And we are hoping to see those resolved in the courts at some point in the near future. And I just wanted to jump in. I know that you did receive a presentation about the parking study. Um, the planning department has been involved in the development of that scope uh, and we are asking as part of the scope of that project that uh, parking requirements uh, within that project area reviewed to provide recommendations for regulatory amendments uh, that sh can be considered. Um, these regulatory amendments should uh, consider things like the existing parking inventory and how regulations and the inventory really do uh, affect one another. Uh, the community values for the downtown, including historic character, environmental protection, pedestrian supportive infrastructure, and downtown viability, taking a look at how parking really does affect the character of downtown, on street parking, surface parking, and really what is the highest and best use of those areas, because we have a very constrained downtown, a lot of competition for that space, um, and really trying to figure out where parking fits into that discussion as uh, because I think this is a big question that the community is facing right now. And then available public transit, which always when you start to talk about uh, uh, looking at parking regulations, you want to understand how uh, expecting people to trans to uh, to shift the mode of travel and how and public transit is a very important part of that conversation. And then we also want to take a look at how this has been successfully managed in similar communities. We aren't like a lot of the communities around us uh, uh, in New Hampshire and really trying to understand communities that are really experiencing the growth and demand 
in our, in a downtown and very con in a constrained area, how those communities have managed the conversation about parking. And I think that we are slowly starting to recognize that as the, the downtown becomes, uh, um, I'd say, uh, you know, the uh, economic vitality in the downtown continues to go up and the interest in downtown investment, redevelopment, that we start to see, you know, more, um, more folks, you know, walking to get to their destinations as you do in any other destination point uh, that you've probably ever visited in this state and in others. So uh, these are sort of the things that we have sort of worked with Public Works to incorporate into that RFP. We're finalizing, like the Climate Action Plan, both RFPs are being finalized, and I expect will be, um, will be uh, fielded in the next couple weeks. Mm -hmm. so, and that is my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Just before we jump to questions, thank you for that. That was comprehensive, and you guys are doing a lot of tremendous yeah. work. So appreciate all. Mr. Of that. Chairman, before we take questions, can I just say I hope people have a snapshot into why we hired Beverly. Um, she's good with the technical aspect. She's good with the outside of the box thinking. She brings experience from different communities that have some similarity to Portsmouth. She really brings uh, planning as we know it to the next level. And and. Just by the sheer numbers, we don't act like a city of 22,000 people. This is almost like Boston Redevelopment Authority numbers. I mean, um, so um, I give uh, Beverly great kudos. She hit the ground running, and three days later, we handed her outdoor dining and a whole bunch of code <laughs> compliance things. And she's um, she's still standing and she's still smiling. So thank you. I just want to say that coming from Redmond, which is I think four light rail stations coming in, that redevelopment was happening just in real time as soon as it got approved. And my boss was like, well, I bet there's, you know, it's probably a lot slower. I said, no, it actually isn't. <laughs> it's not even any slower. It's just, it's just in a more constrained environment. It's like yeah. Redmond, but in a much more constrained environment where there's a lot more um, things to consider within that environment, So, uh, including a historic character, which is something we didn't have. So uh, it's, uh, it's good to be in a community with a high level of uh, activity. So, Welcome. We're very glad to have you. We'll start with Sarah. I have three questions. Uh, so first, thank you for the presentation. I'm wondering if we have like a citywide map that might have, you know, from a visual perspective to see where the developments are, where they're at in phases, because it would help help to understand, um, or at least for me to see it. The uh, I live off of Lafayette. It, it's very difficult to get out onto Route 1. Um, some of the development we've had, even with the um, the uh, West End Yards, makes uh, Route 1 traffic difficult. So I'm concerned as a resident and uh, you know th do we have the right traffic study on route one I understand Portsmouth doesn't have full control over that because it's a state road but do we anticipate um, additional improvements made in route one traffic flow given the number of residential units that we're looking to, to bring into the city so I know that when it, all development projects come in that we expect them to do a traffic study as part of that and that when we do determine that there is going to be additional lanes or signalization, we work with them to, to do that. I don't know what the particular um, plans are for, uh, for Lafayette, but I can definitely get back to you with some information or this entire uh, committee with some information about that. But I know that every project that comes in uh, that tips a certain level of um, trips would require a traffic study, and our traffic engineer, Eric Eby, who uh, left but then is back, and we're too much to our joy and excitement, <laughs> um, really does review those and where we require some um, cost sharing and some uh, uh, um, additional funding to help deal with additional signalization. Uh, intersection improvements or even widenings, we work with the developers to get that. But I don't know what specifically is pending there, and we can get yeah, back to I think to in that. aggregate, I don't know if it's possible to look at it with all of these projects in mind and the Peverly Hill row, so I just see a lot more <coughs> congestion in that area. Let me jump in, because yesterday Eric shared an email with, okay. with Beverly and me uh, that reminds us that DOT's Route 1 project is going to start up again, and they'll stand up some more public advisory committee meetings. And previously, we had a member of the council and a member of parking and traffic safety on that committee, um, but maybe it makes sense for someone from EDC to sit as well. Or a neighborhood in sure. Ellen Park, perhaps. Sure. And I know Pemberley Hill did uh, contribute to roadway improvements. I know that's part of that project, mm -hmm. and they are constructing as part of that project roadway improvements. Um, so I know that for that project, there actually is uh, a contribution and some road construction that, that okay. they'll be doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then my last question was around the regulatory work plan slide, um, when you talk about incentives for developers. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about some of the projects that have been in the news lately, uh, the Banfield housing project where um, developers have to prove hardship. How do we 
how do you reconcile having to prove hardship to redevelop a parcel, you know, for, for public good when it's not a hardship on the developer, but maybe it's a hardship on the community? I don't know if that's a question for you or maybe for mm -hmm. the council from a policy perspective. How do we make it easier if, if we need this housing? So that particular hardship had to do with a variance hardship because I think they were seeking a variance for uh, basically the use is not allowed on that particular site, so they need to demonstrate that there's a hardship. Typically that's a little different in terms of variance. You have to show that it's not it's really through some issue associated with the land or the parcel configuration that prevents me from having enjoying the same rights and opportunities that everyone around me is enjoying. So it's a different hardship threshold. I think, um, and a different question about whether housing is appropriate for that area, and I think that question is before the Board of Adjustment as we speak. Um, I think, um, and the larger scale, I think that uh, developers have an option. They, we do not require that they do workforce housing. We try to incentivize and give them additional density or maybe make it such that the density that they need to make the pencil out is they really need that density and will work with us. Uh, they, it's not typically chosen by developers. And um, we are looking to figure out why and how. You don't want to create a situation where you chill the market because now it's not possible for them. You, you want to make sure you understand where the tipping point is and make that work for developers so that they choose that option. Um, and I think that's a bigger challenge than just changing the regulations. But I think we're committed to doing it the right way, understanding and having developers as part of that conversation and figuring out why it's not working and how we can make it work. And I'll just defer to council for any additional information about that. I think Tom was next. I have two questions. Uh, the first is I, I noted with interest in uh, one of the papers earlier this week about the concerns of a heavy industry uh, down off of Lafayette Road and uh, Banfield Road of having residential development built in that area. Um, I've sort of been waiting for this to happen uh, because as the city has become infilled, uh, housing is now heading down in that area, like two or three of the projects you showed relate to that. So, uh, and, and with the, uh, I mean, I, I, I can see sort of a pressure start to develop on some of the, what has currently been zoned uh, uh, industrial to have that converted to housing. And so I wonder if the department has started to think about how from a planning point of view to address, you know, the what will be more and more housing down in that area of town. So it really, for me, I remember when this, when that particular project came up, I said the first question I asked was how protective are we of our industrial area? Some communities I've worked in, well, the last one, those areas, because, you know, we know that a diverse economy is really a resilient economy and how how valuable are those industrial lands to the community? And, you know, there's trade-offs, as I mentioned earlier, with that three-legged table. When you move the bar here, you may move the bar somewhere else. And that's okay sometimes if, we're, if we are intending to do that. Uh, so I think there are two issues that need to be sort of fully discussed, and I think it is before the Board of Adjustment. And certainly if you have any comment to that point, I think they would welcome that input. Uh, really is, you know, do we want to see conversion of as a community of industrial areas? Uh, because once you introduce that, there is, you know, it does, you do start to see other industrial uses start to have conflicts and then they also transition. So you really do set in, in, in motion a pattern and then maybe that's what the community intends, you know, to do. And then I think the other question is, you know, Given the nature of the area, is this an appropriate place for it? It's a it's an odd area because across the street there is some big there's nice really terrific fantastic residential developments. There's a school, um, and so you could say, well, it's getting residential already. But right next to it, there's some other industrial conflicts. So it really is a question that is uh, is being deliberated right now. And any comments input you have would certainly be welcome. I think. Would that just I might ask, is that more of a zoning issue? So if that zoning in that particular parcel or throughout the city, if that was something we wanted to explore, you would address through that so that you wouldn't have to prove hardship if it were allowed by zoning? If it were allowed by right, and so typically that process of moving an entire zoning district out of industrial to residential would be a master planning sort of effort. What's the community vision for that area? If the community vision for that area is transitioning out into a different direction, then we would start to implement the zoning. There would be non-conforming uses that would transition over time. This is typically how zoning moves from 
and it's it's really tied to what the community vision is and we would ask is this really what we want here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you um, can I have my second question? Sir? Sure, Tom. <laughs> um, I was interested in, in your um, one of your spreadsheets about public transport, and I, what's your, I hate to use the word philosophy, but your philosophy on the role of the planning department in public transit. Uh, do you see that as the department being led by initiatives by the city council, or do you see the department developing a uh, public transit model or at least bringing the questions out there for mm -hmm. debate everything we do is led by the City Council we work for the City Council and I'm not just saying that I actually believe that philosophically that that is our role I think that the City Council is should you know is guided by the vision as we articulate as a community in the master plan and they advance the goals of that vision if the I think that in terms of transportation, the, the transportation goals of the you know the community as expressed through the council, we support that. I think the planning. I, I think we, you know, in terms of the climate action plan, we'll see some goals for I think for transportation that come out of that. I think we look to our our planning documents to help set the agenda, and we ask the council what are the priorities within that context. It is how we set the regulatory amendments. We look to the council. What are your priorities right now? I hear a lot of discussion about maybe some additional, you know, some EV charging stations, but because that actually was referred to the planning board, maybe an energy package that comes after the housing package. I, I have to, I look to the council to set the agenda for that. When we do uh, transportation planning, we uh, we will look to the goals that the council has set. We look to the plans the council has adopted, and we bring those initiatives forward based on the plans. Council adopts those plans. They should take a good look at what they're adopting and what the goals are there, because I think that is incumbent upon our council to say, this reflects what the community says and what we reinforce as a council. But I don't think I have a philosophy that's independent. And I'm not just saying that because it's the right thing to say. I actually uh, think that that is where uh, where we belong as public servants is really to uh, serve the priorities and the objectives of the council. And so we, when we did develop the regulatory plan, <laughs> we did link it to all the plans, all the actions that are in the master plan and also the council goals that were adopted saying this is in alignment with those uh, goals and objectives expressed by the community and reinforced by the council. Mm -hmm. Council Lombardi. Uh, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is what is the status of Pleasant and State Street, um, the hole in our community right now? Um, I, is there anything happening there? Well, the Times Building and the Louis. It's for, still for sale, right? There was an article yeah. in the paper today. Yeah. I, oh, today. I haven't heard. I haven't heard that it's been purchased. Or uh, the, the update really is that the the site is underpowered from a electrical yeah, capacity I'm, I'm perspective. So, yeah. so EverSource is committed to working um, in coordination with the city and with the owner of the property to bring. Uh, power to that site from off-site. It's going to actually come quite a, a distance, relatively speaking. So that's the that's been the holdup, okay. is the ability to bring the underground. appropriate power uh, underground and down the street. So it's yeah. traveling a distance. Okay. And my, my second one is a little different in that um, it was brought to mind by the um, the new project by uh, Mark McNabb, um, and it has to do with building height. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the problems I see in zoning of having regulating building height is that you, whereas our downtown is, you know, all like this, and it makes it attractive, how do you? regulate or control building heights without creating, you know, a very flat skyline. Um, so we actually have, you know, in addition to our characteristics, which are, are nuanced based on the, you know, area of the downtown that they, uh, that they govern, building height standards that really do take into account, and it's really lines on a map that really take into account what the surrounding properties are and try and create that consistency and that rhythm along the street. 
we have complicated sites. Sometimes they pick up more than, especially as lots are merged and now it's a through lot and it might pick up the street behind it and so it's complicated. The first package of amendments that we brought forward were really to help sort of in the implementation of that. It is more complicated than I think other jurisdictions I've worked in. You know, in Redmond we had just straight height. <laughs> so this is a little bit more nuanced and I think we do have a very nuanced code and I applaud the planning efforts that went before me um, and the planners that were involved in that, many who are still on staff today. Uh, particularly Nick Cracknell, who really uh, helped to bring about a, I think, a, a thoughtful implementation of building heights that respect the context of the street, the rhythm of the street, and really, and the pedestrian experience along that street. And I think that it's, it makes it more complicated to implement. We have little lines all over the maps that say this is four stories, this is three stories, you know, and, um, but that I think does create that sort of experience and sense of place that you described so aptly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think Ann had a question. Was it answered? Um, you had um, your hand up at one. You started to touch on it with transportation. Is there any thought of requiring developers to add EV chargers in residential and um, the office commercial space? So we haven't. I, I know that we have uh, some pending zoning amendments that have been referred to the planning board. I think we'll take those up um, as part of the next package of amendments, it looks like. Uh, but the requirement that, that they must do that, I don't think we're there, but it may come out of the Climate Action Plan that this is a regulatory change that's recommended. I think the first package of amendments is really to make it easier to site these types of facilities and to create the, um, remove any zoning barriers to the creation of more EV charging stations. We do have one coming in at, um, I guess, the former Burger King site. I'm trying to think of the, the yeah. Oh, the, it's going to be the Common Man, and they are, it, they are, um, uh, proposing, I think, uh, is it, it's either eight or 10 EV charging stations. Um, so that is, uh, and I, I think we're starting to see those come in more often now. Uh, I think that moving to the requirement might be something that is a recommendation that comes out of our plan, and if the council prioritizes that, that will be something we move forward. Thank you. Great. Jacob. Um, two questions. Um, first, I second um, what Sarah said about having like a map of visual kind of representation of where all the I want that too. <laughs> she was saying that I thought that would help me so would, much. Yeah. Uh, is that all this information you provided, like where the developments are happening, is that kind of publicly available or is that something you kind of pulled out of your records? So I really had different staff running through my office and said, oh, you forgot that one. Oh, you forgot. So then I was like, oh, okay. And then I had to go in and look up the details and they're all in different stages of development. So it, it I, I think that maybe I wish I had you know, had to create a more consistent how each of them was presented. But I think that it would be a really great idea, and it, it certainly I've had it before in um, where I was in the location I had before, where we basically had a page development projects underway. Um, and then you could click on it and you could see the documents associated with that project, maybe a picture of what's coming in as they get to building permit. I think that would be a really great thing. And we have an intern right now. So yeah, I didn't know if that was like could, on the IT department or something. Like yeah, some we could get him to help or, with that. I think that would be a really, and it's just a point on a map. I don't think it's, and then we could have a picture with mm -hmm. it and then you could click on and see some of the documents right. associated with the development project. I would actually think that would be a great That's kind of what I was envisioning, yeah. Yeah, I, I actually would love that myself. It would help me, because as I went through this, I, I told staff, this is a great exercise for me, because I, a lot, many of these predate uh, my, um, my tenure with the city, so. Awesome. And then second question, full disclosure, I live at the corner of High and Hanover, so right downtown mm -hmm. across the parking garage. So in any of these kind of development plans, are we trying to kind of create this like urban core of a city? And on top of that, I see a few glaring holes now. For example, you talk about walking. Um, there isn't like a full service like grocery store downtown, like a pharmacy, stuff like that. So there many been, have there been any kind of proposals to like have one of those come in to downtown that I, I would walk to? Google Whole Foods mm -hmm. Portsmouth. Oh, oh, I remember the Whole Foods debacle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 64 Vaughn was going to be a grocery store mm -hmm. before Novacure signed the lease. Oh, yeah. my God. Gosh, they could really not nice. find a grocery store to step up. Yeah, so I just didn't know if there were any kind of other commercial spaces like a pharmacy, a post office. Yeah. I think a, uh, I know contentious, but yeah, it's just just interesting. I think a, I think a good down a thriving downtown supports both uh, <laughs> daily activity, residential life, and also you know, evening and weekend activity. It supports mm -hmm. you know entertainment and leisure. 
It supports the residents and has everything the residents needs within walking distance. And I think that's a very important point that you make. I'm hoping that our master plan would corroborate that point because ultimately, if you're looking to reduce parking, you really need to create a walkable, livable neighborhood for people who live down there. And that includes pharmacies, restaurants, dental offices, doctor's offices, everything that you need to live down there. And that, the best downtowns give uh, attention to all three, uh, employment, you know, residential life and then leisure life. I think of the of the most important of those three. I think uh, having worked in, in different downtowns, I think having the act, you know, the activity level, the restaurant level, the night is really, really one of the first ones. It draws residents in. I think you have two. I think you have a lot of employment. I think creating that walkable neighborhood where you can get to everything you need is <coughs> should be is a really important uh, objective. And hopefully, we can reiterate that with the next master plan. Thank you, Ben. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, as you're running through the, the extremely long list of projects, that is, you know, very impressive. Um, I, I kept going back to some of the challenges that we've had recently um, that I, th I think has been most uh, publicly um, talked about with the brick market project and the impact that's had on businesses in that area and, and perhaps residential um, mm -hmm. in that area. And, and I, I can't help but look at that list of projects and say that there's more of those kind of conflicts to mm -hmm. come. Yeah. Um, how, how, can, um, how can the city continue to strive to um, communicate effectively and mitigate those uh, potential challenges um, with all this development going down for existing businesses that's maybe been part of our community for a long time or, or as more residential becomes available downtown, I can't help but um, imagine the impacts on, on them as well. Mm -hmm. So how can we kind of mitigate those? We do require a construction management mitigation plan for all those projects that come in and are in a very constrained environment that affect, you know, public roads surrounding businesses. We do require that. Uh, we have to work with those. I think those are um, a great tool. I believe we do invite public comment and, and on those uh, CMMPs. I think that uh, I, I wish I had a good answer for that. I think it is the uh, one of the challenges with redevelopment in a very constrained environment. On a on a different scale, we dealt with that for outdoor dining. You know, I think uh, looking at the you know the project on Penn Hollow and how that affected some of the you know two restaurants that are very close, and had to work with the developer and to get some sort of opportunity for outdoor dining for those businesses. I think um, <clears throat> I, I would say that is it is a problem, and I don't. There's not an easy answer for it. You have to work through that. I would say that maybe. Another way to think about it, too, is it is a good problem to have in some ways. Redevelopment is the lifeblood of a historic downtown. And having a parking problem is something some downtowns dream of, you know? And so it's, it's I a very first world problem. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it is. But I, I don't know that there's, uh, I don't have a great but, answer on that. Yeah, but, but so, so Ben, uh, you may know I've been drafted by DPW to, uh, to speak to people who are impacted by the construction. And, um, a couple things. There's, I, I have heard um, there's going to be some lessons learned from 60 Penn Hollow that will help support how we go forward or how other developments go forward and how the city responds to those. I think that's a, that's a big one because it was such a publicly debated right. issue. Um, the second thing is, I'll just give an example with the, with the Hanover garage, right? The, for three years, we're going to take out 300 spaces and get that facility back to where it needs to be. And, and I'm working with, a, there's a project manager there from DPW who's hired specifically to, to be the point person there. And he and I have teamed up and literally walked the perimeter of the garage and knocked on doors and talked to businesses and, and really anybody who has an open door to let them know what, what's happening and, and the point of contact. So there's been a lot of that communication because that's our, our project, the city project. Um, it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be loud. But uh, I will say that a lot of people, A, they, um, they appreciate the, the proactive communication. Um, and and the, the other opportunity it gave, I'll say me, is, is to say, you know, we, we need this facility functioning, right? It's in your business's best interest. It's in your best interest. So I think just the communication piece is huge, but, but certainly the lessons learned for the next CMMP uh, is, is going to be helpful to, to your point. Great. Thank you. I think Council Lombardi had another question. Yeah, uh, it wasn't a question. I was just um, in the historic district, at least, there is um, a 3D map facility that you can really 
use and look at what projects are going to look like in where they're being placed. And, um, you know, I, I know it's expensive to add properties to that map, um, but it's a, it's a wonderful resource if, no one, if you haven't taken a look at that. And it's on, it's on the, uh, oh, it's on the website. Yeah. Yeah, you can Pretty neat. Sort of joystick around on it. It's, yeah, it's, it's cool. great. We're, we're hoping to add some more properties to that. We're working on that right now. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I just had a question about some of the projects that were shown as uh, approved or in process. I know several of them. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of the, the Deer Street near the new garage. Um, are those at the point they had issued or you had listed that they're seeking building permits or kind of in the preliminary stages? I think those had been sort of not in process for some period of time, but are those active and within their approval still? So it's my understanding that it, at least two of the projects I presented were under litigation, but that has been settled at this point, and so we are hoping to see those projects move forward. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think one of them does have a foundation permit, but I think that, that we are hoping to see those move forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions or comments? I can just say, I, I think it's fantastic to see. I mean, we've kind of kept pace and had conversations like these over the years and, and seen other projects under construction. And I think it's, it's almost breathtaking to see the same volume of projects under construction. And it's certainly, you know, it's uh, a good problem to have from an economic <laughs> development standpoint in the city. So we're really thankful for all that, that the planning department does on behalf of the city. And, um, I would, one other question that I think uh, inspections fall under planning as well is that mm, they're separate departments separate department. but we work okay. very closely with them okay mm -hmm. I was just wondering have you uh, do you have visibility into how long the um, process might take for um, projects um, take a step back uh, wondering if if you've heard any feedback from a planning perspective on how that has inhibited projects I think Generally, if they're looking to move forward, um, they've worked through the inspection process, but and I guess probably the list of projects still coming is a testament to that, not holding developers back, but has that been feedback that you've heard at the planning level from developers? I, I, I've heard about it in former years. I think we have two silver bullets on staff that keep that moving, and one is our building uh, official, which is uh, Shanti Wolf, but then all we also have in the planning department, and this is a, a, just a very important position. I can't, I can't overemphasize how important this job is. Uh, we have a development compliance coordinator. So once they get out of the land use boards, they have to basically satisfy stipulations. They sometimes have to pay, pay funds to support roadway development. Sometimes they have to contribute to uh, create additional sewer capacity. Some, and often, almost invariably, they have to get easements in place. And so our developments review complier coordinates with all the departments to get everything satisfied so they can move forward with their building permit. And I think that we have a very proactive building official. I have heard that that has, you know, that we have had some. I don't, you know, maybe that's been a little bit of hold up in the past. But I do think there is a, uh, a strong commitment on, on what I consider really some of the most professional staff I've worked with um, to really uh, muddle through because these are complicated projects and work through the uh, the nuances of what the planning board wants to see, what the uh, some cases what the conservation commission wants to see, and get those satisfied to and and keep the promise to the community because through those public hearings we say we will do this we will do that and get those uh, commitments honored and move the project forward. And so uh, I think that uh, I've, I've heard that, but I don't think that is going, I, I want to say that sometimes there's some problems that are not necessarily on our end. We're working through a lot of easements, securing easements and things of that nature. But I would say that um, going forward, I don't see that as being a major impediment for developers. Mr. Chairman, can I add to that? Yeah, of course. In the last seven or eight months, we've hired a second plumbing and HVAC inspector, so that helped with backlog. And in the last four to five months, we've hired an, ass uh, an additional assistant building inspector. So we've, we've really gained a lot of capacity. And, Ch and under Shanti's leadership, and Shanti only beats Beverly here by a month, mm -hmm. uh, those two hit the ground running. He has cleaned up the backlog. So if you were to file a permit today, whether you're a residential or a commercial user, you would not see the backlog. That's great. And um, it, it initially, it was asking Shanti to pull needles out of haystacks to move things along, and then the haystack has gone away. So, um, and it's nice to see Shanti and Beverly working together so well. They, they sit on the same floor of City Hall for a reason, and I think there's a lot of great communication. That being said, I think it's fair to say that if there's any feedback, good or bad, that we still need to hear, I'm, we'd, be, we'd welcome it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I know 
feels like a lot of headway has been made, so that's great. Yeah, I, I've heard very positive things mm -hmm. in that space um, over the last few months, so um, it's it's been noticed in the community and it's been well received. Awesome. I was just going to say too that one of the things that Shanti did was to um, make it so that an inspector could come when the uh, owner was there or when the contractor was there. It used to be that the contractor always had to be there and to, you know, get the contractor there was always a problem. Challenge. So that's really helped that as well. Um, I might be curious with one more question. With your perspective from your previous um, geographic location, would it be, uh, I'm wondering how the entitlement process compares from a time frame perspective. Do you find that um, given our historic district, it's kind of a longer entitlement process in Portsmouth or what? Uh, I would say, uh, I would say the timelines were not, uh, were not that different. Right. Um, I think that uh, there, the entitlement process was uh, to a certain degree managed by a hearing examiner. There wasn't this, and we did not have uh, as many boards and commissions to manage, um, and it has to do with the function of growth management in the state. But I would say that the development standards were complicated in a different kind of way, um, and the projects were much bigger, I would say, you know, much larger projects, and then we also had some environmental constraints with dewatering and things of that nature. But uh, the land use board process, uh, um, I would say we have four boards. Often you have to go to all four <laughs> to get to get forward. But I would say the entitlement process was probably the same. Um, the post entitlement process, when they had the land use entitlements in place, um, I, I think it was very similar. It was just the projects were, I think, just bigger, mm -hmm. not as constrained, but bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was, Glad to be here. That was great. Thanks, Beverly. Thanks, Beverly. So I think that's all we have on our formal agenda today. Um, I don't see any members of the public in our Zoom is nope. just our commissioners today. Right. So our, let's talk about our next regular meeting. Um, I think that would be, just pull up the calendar here. <clears throat> so I, September 2nd would be the first Friday of the month. Um, that's heading into Labor Day weekend. Um, we could talk about whether that's appropriate or if we want to think about September 9th. Does anyone have any feedback either way? I'm a big proponent of September 9th over the second, but I'm not a voting member. So. <laughs> <laughs> feedback is feedback. Either way is fine. Anyone else? I, I tend to feel the same. We're Either kind of meeting late in July. I think July. the 9th is fine if, if we want to have a Labor Day weekend. 9th is fine. Great. 9th is better. I don't think we need to take a vote on that. Right? Uh, I don't think so. Great. So we'll plan on the ninth and work on the agenda and hope for another great meeting. But Tom? I, I'd just like to add a sort of a postscript to Beverly's comments and, and related to the transportation uh, issue, and that is that um, I, I think if we're looking at, looking at uh, or examining parking issues, it ought to be expanded to be a parking and transportation issue. I, th I think this is a city council yeah. issue, but, you know, the concerns that Sarah has been talking about of traffic on Lafayette Road for now a couple of years are only going to get a lot worse as these projects come online. And um, just a personal experience, on Saturday I was running my errands, went over to the dump, came down Beverly Hill Road, turned on to Lafayette Road, came to a stop. The traffic was backed up. It took me almost a half hour to get to West Road, in which I gave up, took a right, went back out, and then went down uh, Banfield Road. And it was because Water Country yeah. mm -hmm. had the whole thing. Well, yeah. Yeah. Ninety eight degrees on a Saturday. Yeah. Well, it, 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 but what what I've seen, and some of this is due to the fact that the post office is out there in the, in the sticks, in my opinion. But <laughs> <laughs> there we go. The, the, the traffic on on Banfield Road is probably twice what it was yeah, sure. two yeah. or three years ago. And all this is going to get worse. And so I, and when I think about the downtown, you know, once Nova Cure has all its people in that building, and never mind about what happens with um, 
you know, McIntyre and everything. It, it, I don't oh, think that. we, I don't, <laughs> I don't think we can think of this just as a parking yeah. issue and, and trying to figure out a way of reducing parking. We've got to think of a way of getting people around. Okay. And so I would, I don't know if this committee has a role in that at, at this point. Um, and I, this is just something I've come up top of my head now, but uh, I, I think it's from a business point of view, we could just get ourselves in a complete log jam. Yeah, no, of course, I think, especially as parking inventory comes offline, and we've had conversations in the past about shuttles and transportation throughout the city, and I think you know, it's, it becomes more acute with more housing units and more people back at P's, and you know, we're gonna get more congested as the world continues to get back to normal and we have all this development coming online. So I, I think absolutely it's something we should be thinking about. I know we've been thinking about it in the past, but I don't know where those conversations start. You know, is it parking and transportation? Is it part of the zoning and the study that comes out of that? But we, I think we should be. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, just, just listening to Beverly say that she looks for direction from right. the city council, right. I, you know, I, I, I think we're just going to be you know, <coughs> so un unprepared for right. what, what is really coming down the road. So. I know we do have a transportation master plan, and so that's, I, think, I think that also is a good guiding document about projects that are matriculating, and I wish I could speak with more authority on that. I haven't done a deep dive into that, but I know there has been a larger plan developed for the community, recognizing, I think, a, you know, trip counts and things of that nature. So that, because I think that is, that does inform, you know, where you're seeing most of your trips, where you're having uh, traffic problems really did inform that study. So I don't want to say that we aren't without any guidance, because I think that document is the guidance that we're all kind of looking to. The we, the year that yeah, I was going to. Yeah, I don't know. Is it two? Th is it? I was going to say if that's more than, yeah. you know, four or five years old, it's it's got to be changed. It, it might need yeah. to be updated. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, the catch twenty two is it could be more than four or five years. Four it could have been done in two thousand twenty, yeah. when everything right. you know, <laughs> down. So, right. But I, I just I, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but just I I think that that is something that we ought to. I think we can dig into that in some way uh, so. for the city council to take a bigger view of this. Yeah. On a proactive basis, so I yeah. think that's a good thought. That's Sean all. and I will put our heads together I would agree with that. be sure to look in. Great. Great. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Anyone else have any comments, questions? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.